culture gone bad is back on a very special day, which is uh, the 7th of July, Drupal today. And this morning started with a very, not necessarily shocking, anticipated news about which we have been talking before, but in a very short time, we will have uh, no current prime minister who resigned today. Boris Johnson is leaving us. Um, yeah, is it will be alive still. I mean, yeah. Hopefully, I mean, yeah. who knows? No one knows who <laughs> will be know. alive. You never know. You never know. But uh, that's it. Uh, we don't have prime minister anymore. And by the way, did you understand what happened with that? Because uh, as per yesterday, and no, this morning, he he said that he will be prime minister until until autumn. So by the time this goes online, it may be that he is prime minister. That he, there is already another prime minister because things are changing so fast. I mean, it's it's a mess. Like you know, I feel I feel like over what five or six years. We keep on having some sort of a musical chess in our political exactly. uh, leadership, which um, I think it, it poses a big question, like does stability bring us sort of a more resilience? Because let's say, I'll give you an extreme example, Russia. Putin has been in power for I think like 30 years or something, and the country is shattered. And mm. look here in the UK, we have this political switch over all the time and it also does not give us any more hope for the future yeah i i think that this is the opposite of stability though i mean obviously your point is valid you're saying russia is a very stable country uh, and has a lot of problems whereas here is a more unstable country and also has a lot of problems right Having said yeah. that, I would still prefer our problems to the Russians. So clarify. No. So, so now oh, that we made oh. a lot of Russian friends. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> Such um. No, but the, the, the point is, I think this the two things are related in terms of the, the problem is that our problem is not that the instability of is is that our stability hinges upon individuals so the problem in russia is not that there is a, a stability of ideal but there is a stability of uh, of person is always putin right yeah. uh, uh, to me a healthy system is stability of a system itself then the individuals within the system can change but the system goes ahead yeah that is stability absolutely fair uh, I mean, I mean, you can say when in the UK we have stable system, but we just don't have a prime minister who lasts. Like so, yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. But you, in a in a healthy system, if the prime minister is wrong, you change it, and you and there is another one. And, yeah, but and the system doesn't fall apart because an individual falls apart. That's the difference between systems and individuals, basically. Yeah, yeah, but like. Why, why, okay, why do you think we don't have a prime minister who lasts? Like, yeah, I think a prime minister who lasts is not the uh, the, the big trouble. The big trouble is that when uh, the, the reason why Boris Johnson didn't leave before is because the party didn't have a substitute for him. Uh, is the fact that there are no substitutes because we trusted the individual too much. You know, Boris Johnson is not a conservative. Mm. I spoke, I've got conservative friends. I don't know about you. Do you have any conservative friends? I'm sometimes one day if I have any friends. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, I do have, I do have a lot of labor friends, a lot, but that is obvious because obviously I'm in London, everybody wants to be a labor, um, but I do have conservative friends as well. And they all hate Boris Johnson. And they say that Boris is a basically one told me yesterday, this is not a conservative, he's a Lib Dem, and, and we don't. So the idea is that he betrays the, the ideals of the party, um, and therefore uh, that's the reason why he doesn't, is not really liked by the party. Because so they must be celebrating today, then. They all, oh, they celebrate, they left, 53 people left. <laughs> I think as, as per this afternoon, 59 people left the government. Oh, wow. Wow. I mean, uh, probably lots of uh, aspirational career choices are yeah. going to happen. So I think the problem with Boris Johnson is that the divorce between, between the 
ideals of the party, the conservative ideals, you know, the individual, lowering taxes, etc. And so the betrayal of those ideals to embrace other ideals that are a little bit fuzzy and you wouldn't know where to place them, whether amongst the more progressive, the more liberal, it's a very confused approach. And I think, to be honest, this is something that all European parties and not only Europeans uh, have done, even Trump, no? I mean, I don't, I don't know, like, I, I just feel, I wonder if it's lack of character and charisma, because oh, Trump lasted, like, you know, he even left with, uh, what was it, takeover of White House, like, uh, it was quite spectacular the way, like, he left, so, yeah. you know, from this perspective, Trump, not everyone, but there was a support behind Trump. Yeah. Boris Johnson is living and people were booing him yeah, for uh, a long time. The, the, I don't think that the um, polls are showing that Boris Johnson, people don't like Boris Johnson as much as we would like to think. I think is that the fact that his party is withdrawing support does not necessarily reflect the country withdrawing support does it make sense yeah but it's I, the party that doesn't want him more than the uh, the people i don't know in the north of england fine so uh, but like you say you have your conservative friends has mm -hmm. anyone explicitly said how much we admire boris johnson no so here we go i i'm, I'm you know i'm not politically uh, statistically versed but I haven't come across a single article or personal opinion where someone would say, you know what, I really believe in Boris Johnson, he will take our country far. Whereas with Trump, I've met supporters yeah. and I read a lot of uh, opinion pieces where people express what uh, Trump has a point. And actually there are a lot of people online who still up to today yeah, support yeah, yeah. him. Yeah, absolutely. There are two caveats to this. One, Trump did not, uh, was not reconfirmed. And this is very weird in American politics, because usually in America, the president is always reconfirmed twice, like Obama was reconfirmed twice. Trump is one of the exceptions to this rule. He was not reconfirmed. And I think that you're right. He had a lot of support. The only reason why he was not reconfirmed is because of COVID, because he fucked up on COVID. I mean, uh, who didn't? Yeah, who didn't? That's the thing. Yeah. So Trump, I'm not really sure that, uh, but, you know, and, uh, and that's the first thing. The other thing is that both of them won the elections by being themselves on Twitter, not by having a vision for the country. That's the mother of all problems. Also, another thing, Boris Johnson, he resigned now, but he is he achieved one of the uh, one of the biggest successes for a prime minister in His the elections. His hairstyle in the elections. <laughs> with, uh, with the fashion. I mean, when he was winning in 2019, that was a staggering uh, success that nobody saw coming because at that point, everybody in London thought the that's the time in which labels are going to win mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. people don't want Brexit to happen. They changed their mind on Brexit. And not only they didn't change their mind on Brexit, they confirmed the Brexiteer Boris Johnson, but also he won with a, a huge majority compared to other prime ministers, previous prime ministers. So obviously after you reach that success, you can only decline. And I think he has been blackmailing people in his own party. Boris Johnson. Yeah, saying, you know, the, the, at the end of the day, I made the numbers. So who do you want to put on you know, uh, on, on your support. Uh, yeah, who do you want to give this place to, given that I bring the votes? Because, I mean, the guy was ridiculous. Do you remember the elections when he went with the, I don't know, he would go to a, a convention of farmers and he would dress like a farmer. It sounds Putin style. Is yeah, Putin Berlusconi does? as well. Berlusconi, like, Berlusconi Putin likes, like, you know, in Russia, I always find it hilarious. Putin has a big ties with bikers in Russia. He like puts like leather coat and like goes hanging out with him. It's just like bizarre, bizarre. It's like, you know, meme, meme culture style, political yeah. activism. Also, for, for somebody who hates the homosexuals so much, he has a very, very homoerotic aesthetic, no? But yes, like, very you know, like, he's like, man. him like, fishing, shirtless. Fishing, shirtless, yes. I mean, you know... I but, think but, he, was, but, he was very handsome as a young man. Yeah, you know what, I think this is the big thing about homoeroticism, drug culture. I think sometimes, like, the whole... Um, 
cultural LGBTQ and less abbreviations, it's very much reemphasizing some sort of a fetishes which patriarchal system has mm. sometimes. Oh yeah, 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 totally. It, yeah, exactly. That I mean, that's a little bit the the idea of camp. Yeah. Uh, of of something, right? Yeah. The idea of extremizing, um, of extremizing something, making it into a parody and fetishizing it as a parody. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. So here we go. Next time we see Putin on a horse of bikers, it will never feel the same. Yeah, somebody should tell him. I think we should introduce uh, Putin to Chris Pincher. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or, or Tom of Finland. Or Tom of Finland. No, but you know, Chris Pincher is the politician who this week, last week, uh, was um, basically is one of the reasons why Boris Johnson resigned is because the politician, the Chris Pincher, after getting drunk, pinched. No surname could be better. Um, so <laughs> basically, touched uh, some somebody's ass. Uh, <laughs> um, when I saw this news, I. I frankly, maybe I'm very desensitized, <laughs> but I didn't understand what was wrong about it. Uh, and, and still up to today, my Forly Express, I don't think there is anything wrong. Well, the I think the only thing- Oh, am wrong, I, do you think I'm gonna get canceled? I think you are. Oh my God. Because, I'm because today uh, you can do anything just with, with consensus. You, the people have to agree to it, consensus, yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah, consent. consent. So yeah, that was without consent. That's mm -hmm. why. And apparently it was not the first time that he was doing it and Boris Johnson knew about it and he decided to appoint the filthy homosexual uh, to <laughs> and, and notwithstanding the, the uh, you know, allegations and yeah. From Chris Pincher to us Pincher is, <laughs> is, a, <laughs> is a very tiny leap. <laughs> hmm. I do wonder, like, but yeah, but uh, I, I don't know. That doesn't I, I guess? Yeah, I guess we live in a very consensual society. Still, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the... but generally, I don't think it's that bad. Like, you know, okay, he slapped someone in the. No, to be to be fair, I don't think. But it doesn't matter what I think because it didn't slap my ass. But <laughs> oh well, Jeffy, well, I mean, <laughs> maybe uh... next time it's gonna be me. Just maybe. No, um, no. Here's the thing. I think we are. This idea is getting out of hand because uh, I don't know how you feel about this, but I do understand. About being slapped in the ass. No, yeah, <laughs> I do understand about the safetyism and I do understand about co consent. I do understand about all these things among adults etc i think this is also the 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 limits of this are very fuzzy because how do you determine it for instance the uh, lawyer who uh, defended weinstein mm -hmm. she is a brilliant lawyer she's called donna rotunno and always very well dressed in Ferragamo. <laughs> and she had a theory, I mean, she, very provocative, of course, because she was, she was defending somebody who was very difficult to defend, if not impossible. But her theory was for any man, before having sex with a woman, get a written consent form signed. Have you ever, okay, uh, I know you wouldn't like it, but have you ever got a written consent from anyone to have sex with? Or have anyone made you write written consent? No, but I think the system is, is, there is a very fine line between doing the right thing and being safe and, and, and killing sexiness forever and ever and ever. Like, because the yeah. more you put rules, the more, unless it's some sort of sadomasochistic game in which people write consents as a form of, uh, uh, you know, uh, arousing, but otherwise it's very unsexy. Yeah, that, that's... and the, the abuse of it is bad, but the you know gen on a daily basis is unsexy. But also, like uh, I don't know what David Pincher was supposed to do to go around pop and being like, "Hey guys, um, do you mind just sign this paper? I feel like I'm going to be slapping and pinching some I people tonight. Yeah. Do, do you mind?" I, I don't want to say something wrong, but I think it was a waiter, maybe some waiter. So anyway. It's a very sad story. Also, the thing is, the moment in which they want to get rid of you, they will use even, you know. I hope the waiter, sorry, but I hope the waiter wasn't carrying a pincher. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a very sad story. Yeah, I, I don't know who he, who's us, 
uh, he pinched, but I think, <laughs> I, think I, I, I don't know, I just assumed it was a, It was unconsensual. A, no, a, a the, funny thing, the funny thing is that after all this, this government had to go through, that this becomes the reason is, uh, I mean, I get it's bad if other people, I mean, because it's at the end of the day, this can be considered um it's offensive know, yeah like, offensive if, if yeah violation want, but also like i i always want you know like for me this story when someone says like you know i had my ass pinched in a club like i always want to say oh you know a restaurant like are you sure there's absolutely nothing from your side you've done which might have hinted to the guy yes, that he could yes, do it? Yes, like yes. I'm, not, I'm not saying that, that was a bad person who had his ass pinched. Like I'm this one I'm saying, but I just say often when someone says to me, "Oh, like uh, this guy, like uh, I don't know, uh, grabbed my ass and he tried to take me home," I'm okay because he was buying drinks here all night. Like and then you you were not like yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. like stand yeah. some sort of a distance from yeah. it. I'm not saying this is always the case and i'm probably already consulted for, mm, yeah. for this episode anyway but i do believe what we have to look in the context just to say what someone uh, you know what maybe the guy was into him and when he changed his mind and then he said you know what i'm offended you pinch my ass but, but yeah like to have a written consent of everyone to have a sex wave it's just like you said it's just very unsexy yeah, and also, also it's very awkward also because we have seen cases of people repenting after consenting to make sense so you mind. say yes and then you say yeah but i did i just said yes because i felt compelled to say yes so i'm very fascinated legally speaking of the of the boundaries between consent and non-consent because even after giving consent, you can, consent yeah and forced consent you can always say you know and then i think in terms and this is more in regards to obviously as um, chris pincher <laughs> was more of a gay problem because he uh, he's what he's he touched gay. he is yeah that, that's the thing he touched some men's um us but the majority let's face it the, the most part of these bad situations happen with women between sexes not within a single uh, oh, not yeah. between men okay the, just, usually the default thing is between men and women i'm just gonna say uh this whole story is it perfect way in Russia? I imagine how Russian headlines today. I haven't seen, but I imagine they probably be like, look, guys, this is why Russia is a superior country. Look, Britain is falling apart because they have gay yeah, sex. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, gay sex ruined uh, the great kingdom of United Kingdom and yeah. our marvelous, uh, you know, Western civilization has fallen apart yeah. uh, because we didn't uh, promote the health relationship. But this is how we're going to build. Kirill said it. Kirill said that the war uh, against Ukraine was the war against the LGBTQ uh, plus West. So Russia must be celebrating. So today. yeah, you know Kirill, the patriarch. Yeah, am yeah. I, am I pronouncing yeah, Kirill, Kirill, Kirill. Patera, Kirill, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he is a big connoisseur of um, you know, in Russia actually. I'm not saying I'm not saying about him, but you know, in Russia, the biggest homosexual community is in the Orthodox Church. Mm, doesn't surprise me. Yeah, apparently, uh, I don't know, apparently there's like some sort of a special G strings which only Orthodox Church has. Uh, yeah, what? yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I love this. I, I, yeah, I mean, like, it's a. It's big... the same with the Catholic Church. Really? Yeah. Um, you see, you see, this is this is the whole reason why we have religion, so people can practice their fetishes. Exactly. exactly. Um, in a very you know wholesome way. But yeah, like, there are a lot of issues with uh, pedophilia in Russian Orthodox yeah. Church. And second is homosexuality, which is like, I think, very abusive, like but way, you way see, make... what you're saying is extremely interesting because the... the... Because you want to get hold of this drink. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want the this drink. I think we should make a business out of um, orthodox gist Uh No, because um, oh, up very often in Italy, you have progressives. I hate progressives who want to give the, the church, any church, any religion suggestions. I hate, the, the, if there is one thing that I hate more than religion is people who are progressive and want to marry uh, contemporary times with the eternity of religion. That's something that I cannot stand. Um, and, and they very often say, you see, you will reduce the problem of um, pedophile priests if you allow them to marry. 
Okay, Very that's, that's which I, ne I never, I never believe no <laughs> with adults <laughs> because they say this is a, uh, this is a, is repression that brings them to do that. But it's not true because I mean I've never believed in that. You are a pedophile if you are a pedophile. No, and, I'm and sorry, doesn't... but pedophilia is a perfect uh, sort of how do you call it field for religion. Because look, uh, what often happens. A child goes to the mom and says, um, I had a very weird experience in the church today. And if a family is very religious, they say, surely the priest knows what he's yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah, trust, yeah. trust the church yeah, where exactly. the good people are. Exactly. And it's very easy to cover up all the fucked up shit you do yeah. under the religious belt. Like, I think yeah, this yeah, is absolutely. a big problem. And also, uh, in, in, in the pedophiles tend to do jobs, tend to go for jobs that allow, the, in which the contact with minors is natural. Like, if you're a priest, it's normal that you have contact with young people. And it's very people. difficult to criticize. And it's very difficult to criticize, yes. So, but what I'm trying to say is that the demonstration that the Catholic Church, that the progressives within the Catholic Church are wrong in terms of marriage, is that in Russia they can perfectly get married because Orthodox priests can marry, but they are still the rates of pedophilia are still high. And I've got a friend of mine who is uh, Jewish and he's an Orthodox Jewish, uh, an Orthodox Jew, and he tells me that the same problem is found in uh, amongst the religious communities. Uh, so, and very often is silenced by the community. It's, it's not that if you can marry, then you are not repressed and you are not gonna molest children. Okay, that, that, that it's not that. It means that you have a problem, you need to cure yourself. Uh, that's it, even if you're married. So, yes, yeah, so what is the real reason why um, we don't have prime minister anymore? Yeah, the, I think it's uh, the, the reasons are the official reasons is that um, the many difficulties that the government has encountered. The real reason, I suppose, is that the, his own party, uh, because the government is not falling because the people don't want Boris Johnson, um, because that's not a reason to make a government fall uh, in itself. You've got every four years, you have compulsory elections in Britain. And, and when you, once you vote, you know that your vote is gonna be, you know, uh, is gonna be valid for four years. So that's not the reason. The reason is that his own party doesn't want him there. They, they feel uh, betrayed by the way in which he interprets the, and they are afraid that at the next elections, you know, the conservatives, that's the big time in which, in which there will be a Labour government. Wow, speaking of Labour government, I had a very immersive experience. I went to, guess what, to the Marxist festival. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I even had been given like a hat, but handband, like very official. I didn't intend like the whole thing. It lasted for three days. And you've been there for three days? No, 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 no. I don't have capacity. Uh, I don't have, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not that Marxist. It was quite interesting. Uh, um, you know, so it, who, who was there? Uh, Marxists, I assume. Yeah, no, individuals. Uh, any, any big names? Yeah, I went to see Jeremy Corbyn specifically. Okay, did he, uh, did he say something particularly anti-Semitic? Because he's known for that. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> it's true though. You know what? He had uh, massive problems with the Jewish community. Um, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn made a speech which was anti-war. And um, I'm gonna do a little sort of uh, non-disclaimer -dis -dis -disclaimer here, right? This is... Uh, I'm not a big expert on Jeremy Corbyn, and I always knew he was, you know, labor leader who eventually failed. That's yeah. what I know. Big time. And then, uh, basically, his speech was sort of a first encounter when I actually spent lengthy time uh, mm -hmm. focusing on him. And it was, it all started with him saying what he's anti-war, he is anti-racism, he is pro, I don't know, pro minor, pro minority, supporting this and that. Like, you know, sort of his whole speech in the beginning and the end was like, I'm, I'm against everything bad and I'm for everything good. And I just thought, well, great. It's just like a crowd pleaser sort of uh, yeah. target you decided to go for. And then he did a literature review of all books he has read on the First and Second World Wars, which lasted about an hour. Mm -hmm. And when he said, like, war is very bad, 
and we need a better society and we need to teach our children not to be violent and, and, and this is countering the idea of who I don't know. I mean, I who, who, the, the, the question is, who thinks that the war is desirable? Exactly. That's no, my point. That's, like Nobody is advocating for war. But this, is, this was my point. I was standing there and I was looking like, well, it was not a big crowd, but you can tell all people are huge fans of him, like hardcore laborists, hardcore Marxists. And it was quite funny. We were selling mini busts of Lenin. Where, like Lenin is not Lenin. Lenin. Yeah, there was like busts oh of gosh. Lenin everywhere. Okay, it I'll, was surreal. Yeah, it was yeah, surreal. Yeah. Uh, okay, I've, I've seen this before. I mean, as, as I said already once in this podcast, I come from Italy. Italy is the country uh, with uh, the in the West, in the, the Western European country that historically has had the strongest communist party. Okay, the Italian Communist Party was directly linked with the Soviet Union Communist Party, mm -hmm. like dangerously linked. Mm -hmm. I think is until the invasion of the of you of uh, Hungary. I think if I'm not wrong, but anyway, it was a big communist party. And unlike Britain, Br the the Labour's are not a communist party. Are founded on the trade union, so it's a bit different. They are not explicitly the the evolution of a communist party in Italy we did have and some of the Italian communist philosophers such as Gramsci has become you know the, the holy uh, growl of uh, of of philosophy and, mm. and also contemporary cultural Marxism um, my idea about how people like Corbyn use the idea of being anti-war um, is this these Marxists say that they are anti-war because they would want this war to end and they want uh, Ukraine su to surrender to Russia. Uh, this is exactly what you're saying, because here we don't have an opposition because between who wants the war and who wants the peace. Here we have an opposition between who wants to invade and who doesn't want to be invaded. War is only resisting for the Ukrainians is only a device not to be invaded. It's not because they love war that they are carrying on this. Okay, it's because but, they don't want to give up. I'm sorry, I haven't heard anyone saying we need this war. Even even Russia, look, uh, their agenda, not supporting it, but even in Russia, the agenda of Putin, we had no choice. Like he's not saying that, you know what, I want to destroy anyone. Of course. The thing is, Every fucking person in this world is saying I'm against war, unless the person yeah. is mad. No, no, hold on. But I think there is a reason why Marxists around the world are saying what Jeremy Corbyn is saying. The reason why they want Ukraine deep inside, they don't say this loud. They say we are for peace. In fact, what they are for is Russia's victory. And why? Because they see in Russia, in 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 Russia, they can go and visit Lenin uh, statues in person. No, they don't have to buy no, mini mummy. The ma mommy. Mommy, but also, you know, in, in each city in Russia, there is a huge Lenin statue. No, so we don't have to buy a little no, one. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, think, I think it's much more serious than that. They think that Russia is today the only huge opposition to the Western uh, capitalistic model, liberal capitalism, uh, the American liberal capitalism. Not China. No, the, mm. because China and Russia are very similar. They are both capitalistic societies uh, full of oligarchs, but th they are not based on the idea of liberalism. They are not based on the idea of, uh, of uh, liber li liberty and freedom, individual freedoms. Does it make sense? They are, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we were used to thinking with the America that the, the democracies are conducive to capitalism. Now we had the demonstration with China and Russia that democracy is not ne necessarily conducive to capitalism. You can have dictators who are perfectly conducive to capitalism, but these old Marxists, they have one enemy. They have no friends, but they have one enemy. And the enemy is the American system. So for them, wishing that this war ends in favor of and, and, and favors Russia is almost like saying we want to demonstrate that you know the big cultural uh, battle has not been won by the United States. Interesting. So I think they are really it's not that they are pro-Russia, they are against the United States. This no, makes it makes sense, but uh, I I don't identify with uh, all these theories. So I went via a sort of 
first of all, maybe to hear Jeremy Corbyn, which I have no fucking clue who he is. I listened to the guy for one and a half hour. Everything he said, it was a literature review about war and how he is against war and how we need the better system. I literally have no idea who he is from that speech. People love him, but I guess it was a crowd who attended, who specifically came to see him. But what I was anticipating, and maybe you say it's very silly, I was hoping to hear different point of view of what we can do with a problem in our society, which I did not get. He just literally said all the books he has mm -hmm. read. And I was like, great. So essentially, everyone is saying the same thing in the end of the day. It's just you kind of have different set of values. But in the end of the day, everyone is saying the same thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if if uh, if Marxists really say what their goal is, nobody would vote for them because their goal is to abolish capitalism. And who wants that, frankly? Who wants to earn less? Who wants to give all their money to the states? They, they want the uh, any. Th th that's what Marxism is about, right? And nobody wants that. So what they can do is saying what the uh, the books they have read and and. Ooh. Sorry. Uh, and the other thing that they love to say is I'm an anti-racist. I mean, yeah, seriously. yeah, but was said many times. No, but seriously, why do you have to say that? I don't approach people assuming that they are racist. Yeah, it's like being a racist is the worst thing you can be, right? We agree on that. Now, it's, uh, it's almost like I try to speak to you and you, the first thing you tell me is I'm not a pedophile, right? Because the moment you say that you are not, I start thinking that maybe there is something there. Yeah. You know? yeah. Oh, so the moment in which you say, I have nothing against gay people, like, I don't. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't. I just want I'm to make it very clear. Right? I, I, no, no, no. I just want to make it very clear, right? So yeah. be very clear. I mean, what, what, what argument is that? How can you begin a, a conversation stating that you are not a racist? Because you are making one one deranged idea pass, which is that in somehow it would be perfectly normal to identify yourself as a racist. I have never met I somebody think, who... I think, because I think I already sort of diminished my credibility in this episode. I'm just going to say it. I think the moment we start saying, uh, let's talk about race, or let's start with disclaimer that we are not uh, racist, I think what's already emphasizing on the, it's creating a problem essential. Yeah. I think if we have to pay so much attention to someone's gender, someone's sexual like preferences, someone's race, someone's background, we have a problem. Because we don't start with conversation saying like, Jupiter, I shouldn't say I don't have any problem with anyone who doesn't have blue eyes. It's like that. Like it's yeah, it's like that. Yeah, exactly. Like why you we segregate. have to? Why we have to like make so much uh, attention? We have to put so much attention on someone's appearance. Like this is just fucked up to me. I, I think it's a big problem because yeah. the moment someone starts to identify with their race, I think we kind of cut away any other values this person has. It's almost if I would start our you know podcast of saying, uh, "Jupi, I'm a woman with blue eyes." It's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I feel like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I, I think the, those these sort of somehow trigger warnings. Um, also, I mean, there is a deeper difference that we don't have the time and to go into, which is the difference between being a non-racist person and being an anti-racist. Those are two, two very different things. But obviously, you know, one thing is being non-racist, one thing is being explicitly an anti-racist, which is a very specific uh, subspecies of cultural Marxism today, you know, where cultural Marxism is not the old-fashioned Marxism, is not dividing society into rich and poor, as the old Marxists would have been, but is dividing society into many minorities, hoping that these minorities united will form the majority that will get the left to win an election. And this never works because the yeah. moment you should divide a society into many minorities they will each of them will think about themselves and you will not create a big majority out of many minorities but so you still is... can invite all of them to a festival and sell Lenin's bus yeah and it's very interesting to see who goes to these festivals because who goes to these Marxist festivals is not who used to go to those festivals in the 60s it's not working class who want to improve their their position in society and their rights as workers is usually um, urban intellectuals 
who um, have a very who have read Gramsci and all the cultural studies and Foucault and want to fill intellectuals by taking part uh, in in a intellectual debate on Marxism. So it's actually appealing to the opposite type of crowd that used to define themselves Marxists yeah, two generations ago. Uh, a whole crowd was very well read because every time Jeremy Corbyn would reference some offer, some theory, everyone was like, yes, yes. And I was just like, I know nothing. Like, I, I literally felt like no, I'm, I'm completely you should, uneducated. No, no, no. You, should have, you should have cheered anyway. To them, because you had to demonstrate to the crowd that you know who you know all about Foucault and Derrida and and Gramsci. So those people maybe they didn't know anything, but they still pretended, you, you know, think, because you, you go so? there to pretend. Uh, you don't uh, go there. <laughs> wow, wow! Just, I never, never thought. Do you think people sometimes pretend? Because I, I, I totally, they really? totally do. I never thought about and that. People pretend. I think people are genuine. No, people pretend, but also there is another thing. People react, I think, to certain intellectual cues to certain cognitive cues, like when, if I give you an example, whenever people hear words like lived experience, okay, this is a word that I deeply despise. Um, every time people listen to words like the lived experience, they cheer, yes, yes, everything they hear. Uh, th those are words that are cues that prompt people to react because they know that they don't know what the entire meaning of the discussion is, but they know that if you use those words, you belong to a certain elite of lefty intellectuals. Therefore, you need to cheer in order to take part in that, in order to demonstrate that you are uh, you are amongst the chosen, you're amongst the good ones. So maybe no one knew what the hell he was exactly. talking about. So who did he quote? Um, I have no idea, JP. I don't know. I didn't read his books. He quote lots of books about First and Second World War. It was like a literature review, like literal literature review. He was like, this author said that, and that author said that. And then there were a lot of people from U different UK parties who like labor aligned. Yeah. And they were like, you know, you're such a great person, like so mm. good, so good, we support that. And every time someone would name another uh, like party I never heard about, everyone was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He was so good that we lost every possible election I so it, it, maybe it's not that good um i don't know Drip, yeah. <laughs> but, i was hoping to hear something mm, yeah i think i think i'm sorry to have to quote somebody who today is in great has been cancelled more than you and i together which is winston churchill now i'm quoting he it, quoted him he quotes. definitely yeah, I'm quoting Churchill by memory, so maybe I'm getting the quote wrong. But essentially, you know that Churchill, initially when Churchill was uh, was uh, in, he was in Parliament, and uh, when when the United Kingdom decided to to make an agreement with Hitler, and and they decided to essentially sign an agreement with Hitler, and Winston Churchill was against this agreement initially before he became prime minister. He was against this agreement because he was for a war against Hitler. He was the only man in Europe who understood that. The only man in Europe, and. In Parliament, he said something along these lines. He said, "You had the choice." He said to his own government, "You have the choice. You had the choice between honor and war, dishonor and war. You chose dishonor. You will have the war. You know what I mean? That's what it means sometimes being against the war. That you choose dishonor in the name of peace, and you'll get war either way. And this, I think, it's what we have, we would have had if if uh, if Ukraine wouldn't." you know, if the international community would have not reacted to, to Russia. Winston Churchill in that occasion was right, mm -hmm. but that occasion is what allowed him going to war against Hitler is what allowed us today to be free and have this conversation. So I think we should be thankful to him more than to Jeremy Corbyn, to be honest. What do you think the future holds for the United Kingdom political leadership? I do think that Keir Starmer, uh, despite I don't like him, but um, because I don't know, it's very, it's very elitist. He's still a, an elitist leader, but I do think that he will win. This is the for a, for a, I don't know, next elections. I don't think that the Conservatives are going to win. They have been in power for too long, and probably people want to change. 
maybe he will not have a huge majority because the Lib Dems are going to get some votes because people don't like the idea of being taxed a lot. So probably he will not have the same majority as Boris Johnson, but he will probably win. This is what I think. I'm a bit scared. Did you see that? Uh, I think it's Angela Rayner, the, the name of that Labour politician. Let me find the name. Um, mm -mm. So she's the politician who said that not to correct her grammar. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. What video you sent me, the article. Yeah, Angela Rayner. Besides, she's got the name of, uh, she's got a name that reminds me of a cheap uh, air uh, uh, <laughs> oh my god, Rain. oh my god, Angela Ren. No, so basically, in parliament, I was looking into her because a friend of mine mentioned uh, her, um, and I went to look in, and I found this. Uh, I noticed that she, she, she's not very educated, okay, but uh, that's okay, you can be a good politician even without a formal education, that's not the point. But then at some point, she reacted very badly in parliament because somebody corrected her grammar apparently. And she said, don't correct my working class grammar. Hold on a minute, I thought. I never assumed that... Where is working class grammar? Yeah, exactly. I never assumed that bad grammar was working class and good grammar was upper class. I, this, is very, this is very insulting because I come from the working class. My grammar, in Eng when I speak in English, certainly I speak a perfect Italian, but when I speak in English, obviously I don't speak perfectly. I make mistakes. It's not my first language. However, I try to speak as well as I can, and I don't hide behind. It's like me saying to people, okay, don't correct my immigrant grammar. What, what is this? What is the point? No, if I make a mistake, just tell me. Because having a good grammar should not hinge upon your class, should hinge upon your will to learn to speak properly. And I am very worried when, when people make this, uh, this, uh, this idea of, you know, she is, I read a commentary that said she is the perfect idea of, of uh, that the, uh, the, the, the left, the intellectual left, she embodies what the intellectual left thinks of the working class. <laughs> so somebody who doesn't know how to speak, that's the stereotype of that the, 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 the left uh, somehow um, thinks about the working class. We live in a very polarized society and somehow internet and social media make it even more um, sort of alienating because you can just pick the channel which speaks the correct level of language which, <laughs> which you choose to adhere to, which is um, a little bit scary. Well, on the, um, on the flip side, uh, in each episode on Spotify, we do a poll now and I think, Drupal, we will be very pleased to tell our audience what the results of the last poll, which was on abortion rights, mm -hmm. uh, everyone said they are pro-choice. Yeah, of course. I mean, as I was said already, it's a tiny minority in America who are not pro-choice. Their arguments are lame. And every time I hear them, they convince me even more about my pro-choice stances. So, um, yeah, I, I, I would never think that. Besides, it's one of those ideas, I think, that even people who think about, uh, who would not agree, would never say it. It's not an idea that most people would be proud of, I think, except, you know, extremists. Well, Drupi, uh, I think our listeners should watch out for our next poll, because it's going to be interesting. Yes, and just before, what do you think is the future going to be? So I told you what I think the future is. Also because you can, you, I, I'm not a citizen yet, but you can, you vote here, right? Yeah. yeah. So you are? Um, I'm eligible. Um, what's the future is? Drupi, frankly, nothing surprised me at this point. And I'm, I mean, I think I told you, we had off the record, when David Cameron resigned, we probably had more stability in the country, like we didn't have COVID recession. Yeah. And we ended up having Theresa May and it was a mess. So I'm not sure, and I'm not convinced we have anyone else who, you know, will, will resemble some sort of a, a strong leader. By the same time, we have system which sort of functions, not depending on a yeah. leader. 
so I don't think it really matters. But um, I just don't see our society becoming more unified, and that what bothers me more. Mm. I'm not what bothered about who's going to be our leader, even if our leader going to be from Labour, even if our leader will be from, I don't know, uh, UKIP or whatever old parties we have. I'm more bothered uh, what uh, what the split in the society we have. Yeah. And I think it's fine not to agree with each other. I'm more concerned that we don't listen to each other. Because yeah. when I went to this festival, uh, I think I was a minority of person who just came to listen. Everyone was very hardcore supporter. And I think the problem is we go to events, we listen to channels, we subscribe to podcasts, we have friends who usually align with our lifestyle choices and opinion. And we hardly ever expose ourselves as individuals to controversial or different points of view. And I think we should practice it more and we should encourage it in children, in adults, yeah. in workplaces, yeah. in political debates. It's not about agreeing with each other. It's about being able to open your mind and hear an opinion which yeah. you find even disgusting. Exactly. And uh, yeah, and the challenge is your comfort zone. I think that you you, you nailed it. The, 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 this is a coffin? <laughs> you, you nailed the coffin. Boris's coffin, uh, possibly. Uh, and Corbyn's as well. So uh, the, the point is that we as a society, we live in different epistemological realities i always say that it's everybody is reached by different information everybody has a different understanding of the world and this leads to politicians when they are running for elections and this is i think the big problem those politicians are not addressing the center they're addressing the fringes so a lefty would uh, address, uh, would speak to the far left of his own party and, and somebody from the right would address the far right of his own party. And they are missing the fact that if you want to unify a country, you have to speak to people in the middle. Therefore, if you are in the left, you want to be voted by some conservatives as well, somebody who would lean conservative and vice versa. If you're a conservative, you would want some votes from the left as well. That's the way to win. You can't only appeal to the fringes. That is a big mistake. And when Ther Theresa May was in power, we agree that she's not a strong leader. OK, as you said, um, Boris Johnson is a strong leader. She's not a strong leader. But I thought under several points of view, she was better than Boris Johnson. And when people complained about Theresa May, I said, are you really sure you want to complain about Theresa May? You know what comes after. Because at the end of the day, she was still one of the few recent prime ministers who was talking to the center, not to the fringes. So she was, she wanted to get Brexit done, but without being too hardcore. Uh, she had these ideas that appeal to the middle. And by getting rid of the, of Theresa May, because she is a conservative, you will get rid of something that somehow it's speaking towards you and you prepare the terrain for Boris to win. So I think people should be very wary when they criticize a politician just because he's from the other side. And politicians should talk to the center, not to the fringes. I think we need diversity of opinions in that area. I think yeah. everyone deserves a chance to express their point of view. Even if it's just the most ridiculous, I think we should give them a platform and listen to. Yes. I think the worst thing is to cancel censor because one, we only allow specific narrative to be valid. And um, I think that's a problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's becoming more and more prominent. Uh, and this is what I don't see changing in the nearest future. And that's sort of my take yeah. on this. Yeah. Yeah. It's Sa okay. Sadly, I have to agree. Well, on this note, um, guys, leave us your comments, follow us, uh, likes, dislikes. And until next time, Culture con bad says very bad. Says goodbye. Very bad bye. <laughs>